former Luftwaffe pilot, now SS doctor Sigmund Rascher chooses two prisoners from the lineup, Russian men barely out of their teens. These strong men have no idea they're about to become test subjects in Rascher's profoundly unethical medical experiment, bearing the innocuous title, warming up after freezing to the danger point. A few hours later, Rasher jots down in his notebook, subject 115763 naked, time of death 64 minutes, subject 115306 clothed, time of death 102 minutes. This was not unusual. Those that underwent the Nazis' freezing experiments rarely escaped with their life intact. We know a little bit about the experiments of a Dr. Rasher due to the fact that many of the letters the Nazis wrote while they were experimenting on prisoners were later used in evidence during the Nuremberg trials. Take for instance this letter dated October 9, 1942. The correspondence is between Rasher and Heinrich Himmler, the Reichsfuhrer SS. After Adolf Hitler, Himmler was the most powerful Nazi that ever shouted Sieg Heil. The letter starts with, I ask for leave to submit to you the second interim report concerning the freezing experiments. Interestingly, lower down he also wrote that Professor Holzlohner declined to perform the freezing experiments on humans out of shame. Rasher then added, I shall take over the exploitation of them, meaning the humans. It seems not all Nazi doctors were happy about experimenting on humans. In the testimony of SS officer Rudolf Brandt, he talks about Himmler, stating, he further asked Rasher to submit the names of the people who were opposed to experiments on human beings and stated that such peoples were to be considered traitors. Still, if there were such traitors, they were in a very small minority. They did exist though, with Himmler writing to Rasher in one letter, I regard those people as high and national traitors who still today reject these experiments on humans and would instead let sturdy German soldiers die as a result of these cooling methods. I shall not hesitate to report these men. Such was the mindset of the inner circle of Nazis. Being outside all day during the winter in some parts of the world could easily be lethal. Ending up in the bitterly cold waters could be lethal much faster. The Germans wanted to know how to treat their soldiers when they were suffering from hypothermia. These experiments happened at the Dachau camp from August 1942 to May 1943. They consisted of freezing a person to the point of death, although sometimes that part did end in death. This was useful information for the Nazis since such experiments gave them an idea of what a person could survive. Another part of the experiment was called warming up, in which the doctors used various methods to warm someone so they didn't just survive but were brought back to good health. It was almost as if the Nazis were playing God, trying to resurrect people from what looked like certain death. What's also interesting is that there seemed to be some competition going on between various doctors with some medical personnel expressing that experimenting on humans wasn't necessary when animals could be used, in some cases shaved cats. Rasher told Himmler that humans were indeed better, saying in one letter that he needed more Russians. You might wonder why Russians? The answer was the Germans had to fight on the Eastern Front, where temperatures could get very low. The Germans weren't used to this. The Nazis wondered if the Russians had a genetic advantage when it came to surviving the cold. And if they did, they wanted to know why. Further down the letter, he wrote, The experiments of rewarming by body heat, which were ordered, will be carried out as soon as the women necessary for this experiment arrive, in about two days. I shall report the results of this experiment separately. That didn't mean that Rasher was now freezing only women, but that he was addressing Himmler's contention that the best way to warm up a freezing man was to place him between the bodies of two women. It was Himmler's contention that animal warmth, in this case human warmth, was better than artificial warmth. He told Rasher that a fisherwoman could take her half-frozen husband into bed and revive him in that manner. This was actual testimony from a former Nazi during the Nuremberg trials. The man who said the words was again Rudolf Brandt. The report on the rewarming of an intensely chilled human being by animal warmth stated that the experimental subjects were cooled until they all lost consciousness. The test persons were then placed between two naked women in a spacious bed. It was noted that several of the subjects revived sufficiently to perform sexual intercourse. These experiments were supposed to emulate what it would be like when one of their pilots was shot down and ended up in the frigid North Sea. To replicate this, sometimes prisoners were dropped into a bath of ice-cold water. According to researchers, some of them were anesthetized and others weren't. Although we said that Professor Holzlerner might have felt some amount of shame regarding the human experiments, we found a report with his name attached to it that beggars belief. The other names were Rasher and Dr. Finke. The letter concerned giving narcotics to a person before they were forced into the ice bath. It started, if the experimental subject was placed in the water under narcosis, one observed a certain arousing effect. The subject began to groan and made some defensive movements. In a few cases, the state of excitation developed. This was especially severe in the cooling of head and neck. 
The report said that the person then suffered from a kind of rigor, after which the subject started twitching. The report concluded, with still more marked sinking of body temperature, it suddenly ceased. These cases ended fatally without any successful results from resuscitation efforts. Some subjects were naked, but others were fully dressed usually in German Air Force uniforms to create a facsimile of natural conditions. Rasher's letters illuminate the details. He wrote in one report, The experimental subjects were placed in water, dressed in complete flying uniform, winter or summer combination, and with an aviator's helmet. A life jacket made out of rubber kapok was to prevent submerging. In one experimental series, the occiput, or brainstem, protruded above the water. While in another series of experiments, the occiput, brainstem, and back of the head were submerged in the water. We'll come back to why he didn't always fully submerge the person. The doctors checked the person's body temperature throughout and also wrote down obvious clinical manifestations, which in simple terms just means the outward signs of what happened to the freezing person. They also checked for biochemical and physiologic changes, which again relate to the changes in the body. If the person died, an autopsy would reveal more information. So there was Dr. Rasher, thinking he was doing his bit for the cause. During the Nuremberg trials, his experiments were called inhumane and criminal. And of course, they were. But what's also so strange about the man is he lied when he wrote down the findings of his experiments, or at least he lied from time to time. This didn't help the cause at all. It's now said that Rasher was operating under the orders of another person. That was Eric Hipka, the chief medical officer of the Luftwaffe. Together, they came up with the ice-cold water experiments, and they also left some prisoners outside in the cold during the winter months at Dachau, usually naked. The reports we have now state that when left outside, they were usually there for around 14 hours. As for the tub of ice, that could be up to 3 hours, although most people died well before that. The prisoners were usually male, but of various nationalities and ethnicities. We can't always be sure who was part of the experiments because the Nazis destroyed much of the evidence when the war was lost, but thanks to those letters, as well as a 228-page report from the investigator, Leo Alexander, we know some things. We know that the prisoners were forced to do the experiment most of the time, but sometimes they volunteered on the promise that they'd be awarded for their participation. It's reported that those rewards weren't given if the person survived. In total, there were between 360 to 400 experiments, which amounted to between 280 and 300 victims. The temperature of the bath that people were dropped into was sometimes between 2 and 12 degrees Celsius. During the winter, the North Sea's temperature is usually about 6 degrees Celsius. As for hypothermia, that occurs when the temperature of the body drops below 95 degrees Fahrenheit. So if a person sits in a bath of water that's around 40 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, very serious injury and death can happen pretty fast, within possibly 30 to 90 minutes or around the 1 to 3 hour mark, depending on various factors. It's these factors that the Nazis wanted to understand. In some of the reports, the Nazis wrote that when a person was immersed in water that was 5 degrees Celsius, they could generally tolerate it for about 1 hour. If the water was 15 degrees Celsius, they would usually last about 4 or 5 hours. One report said that no test subjects survived having their body temperature dropped to 25 degrees Celsius and then being heated up to 28 degrees Celsius. Some prisoners who later testified to seeing the experiment said they saw around 90 people die, but noted that some did survive after being warmed up. They also said two people became mentally ill, but we don't know when this mental illness occurred. The onset of severe reactions to the cold was fast, as was stated in another report. It said the rapidity of which numbness occurs is remarkable. It was determined that already 5 to 10 minutes after falling in, an advanced rigor of the skeletal muscle sets in, which renders the movement of the arms especially increasingly difficult. That report also said that these considerations had to be taken seriously given that German soldiers in cold water would likely lose most of their manual dexterity. The report noted it is certainly extremely difficult even at the beginning of numbness to climb onto a rubber raft, to blow up a rubber raft for one person, or to make use of instruments or to signal or call. One of the ways the Nazis warmed prisoners up was by immersing them in hot water, but that was too very dangerous. It produces a kind of shock, what we now call rewarming shock or the afterdrop effect. You can look at any medical website these days and it will tell you that if you're dealing with a person suffering from hypothermia, do not put them in a hot bath, instead passively warm them using dry, unheated blankets. Dr. Rasher disagreed with this, stating that passive rewarming didn't work. He wrote in one report, Rewarming by animal warmth, animal bodies or women's bodies would be too slow. He explained this by saying, during attempts to save severely chilled persons, it was shown that rapid rewarming was in all cases preferable to slow rewarming 
because after removal from the cold water, the body temperature continued to drop rapidly. According to research, the Nazis used at least seven different procedures to warm a person. We know that in two experiments a warm bath was used, although some witnesses later said they saw someone being immersed into boiling hot water. We also know that massage was used in some experiments, as were heated light sources. But again, there isn't much data as to how they worked. We should say here that in Rasher's reports there are a lot of inconsistencies, which is one reason why things didn't end too well for that guy. Rasher's report also stated heart failure was the reason for freezing experiment deaths, but that's also come into question, as has his conviction that if a person is not immersed above the neck, he won't become hypothermic. Academics now state that Rasher was not even qualified to conduct such experiments, which is why it seems they were either botched or the results were made up or exaggerated. One scientist later wrote, The Reichsfuhrer expressed special interest in the hypothermia project and traveled to Dachau several times to witness experiments. Thus, the study represents a private venture by two unqualified ideologues, conducted in a prison setting quite alien to the standards of academic environment. We now know that because Rasher was so close to Himmler, no other scientists dare question what he did even though they knew full well he was somewhat of a charlatan. At the Nuremberg trials, it was said that their connections were so strong that practically every superior trembled in fear of intriguing Rasher, who consequently held a position of enormous power. When you hear this next bit of information, you'll agree that he certainly fitted the glove of what we call mad scientist. With so many dead bodies around him, Rasher made use of some of the human skin. With it, he created saddles, riding breeches, ladies' handbags, and other personal items. He sold what he made to some of his colleagues. But his end would come when it was discovered that some of his children weren't his and he actually abducted them. He was also accused of killing his lab assistant and of being a scientific fraud. For these reasons, he ended up in Dachau himself. Himmler felt this guy he'd protected and supported for so long had not only lied to him, but made him a fool. On Himmler's orders on the 26th of April 1945, Rasher was killed by firing squad in his cell. The last words that Rasher heard were, You pig, now you've got the punishment you deserve. Well, that's if he lived long enough to hear them. In the 1980s, some scientists said the data might be useful to help save lives. Baruch Hohen, a Holocaust researcher, had something to say about that. He said, Although use of Nazi data might benefit some lives, a larger bioethical problem arises. By conferring a scientific martyrdom on the victims, it would tend to make them our retrospective guinea pigs, and we their retrospective torturers. For some time, it was assumed that Rasher's experiments could be of some use, but academics were quick to state that there was great risk thinking these grotesque Nazi medical exercises yielded results worthy of consideration and possibly of benefit to humanity. It's thought the number of victims was around 27,000 for all the various experiments, with about twice as many men as women. About 20% of the victims were Jewish, with about 2% being Roma and Sinti. Other ethnicities were stated as other or unknown. When we look at the nationalities, there were many. The countries with the most victims of experiments were Germany, Poland, Russia, Hungary, and Austria, although over 6,000 cases were marked as unknown nationality. There were some countries' residents picked out for lesser-known experiments, such as a handful of British commandos who were captured in Norway. The Nazis tested new kinds of amphetamines on them in high-performance experiments. Now you need to watch The World War II Nazi Breeding Plan or have a look at this.